Hi folks, in this topic we're looking at secure design principles which are really important concepts that we need to consider in the security of any system. So when we are thinking about designing a system or even configuring a system that exists or assessing the security of a system, these are really important concepts that we can apply or a lens through which we can look at a system and consider whether they're following best practices and where this is not um, applying uh, then it's a good chance that there are um, either security problems there or at least ways that we can improve security um, by following the secure design principles as closely as possible. So the original secure design principles were actually proposed in 1975 by Schultzer and Schroeder in a paper the protection of information in computing systems. And, you know, amazingly, um, the principles themselves um, have held, withstood the test of time very well. And there's still things that we consider today. And so now we're going to look at those principles that were proposed in that paper and also some other um, principles that we can consider when designing um, or assessing the security of the system. So, First and foremost is the principle of least privilege. And this is really common sense, is that everything should just have access to the amount of privilege, the amount of you know, permissions and access that is just strictly necessary for the actual intended function to be performed. So that includes systems only having access to you know, the resources on a network, for example, from that system that, it requ that that system actually requires access to, that users on a system only get access to the resources they need to perform their role within an organization, for example, that programs that are running on the system can only actually access the resources that those programs need to perform correctly, uh, that components of a program, so actual functions or classes within a, with a, a program, can only access the resources that are required in order to form that part of what the program does. Um, and you don't have to think very long about this to, to realize that actually the vast majority of the time things run with more privilege than is necessary and um, you know, known as ambient authority. So a lot of the times just by uh, every user on a system gets access to a whole bunch of stuff on that system that they don't strictly need access to and um, you know whenever a program runs on a computer it gets access typically to everything that the user who started the program is allowed to access every program that runs has this ambient authority to access um, you know the, those extra privileges uh, that it doesn't actually need and very few programs are actually designed in a way where they drop privileges um, so, for example, something, someone running as root can actually drop capabilities and drop permissions and privileges so that, uh, so that actually um, if something goes wrong, the, the ability of it to do root things is limited. So um, a lot of the time we could do better with principle of least privilege, but the better we do, um, then the better the security is going to be because everything that we limit or restrict access to is going to limit the damage that can be caused when something goes wrong. So when there's a vulnerability in a piece of software, if it can only access the things that it needed to do its job, then maybe it can misuse access to those files, but it can't then also misuse access to the ambient authority, to the extra things that it has access to. The principle of economy of mechanism is all about simplicity. So the KISS mantra, keep it simple, stupid. Um, each component should be as simple as possible because the more complicated a system is, the more likely that there's going to be a vulnerability in there somewhere. And you could even consider just the number of lines in some code. The more lines of code there is, the more likely there's going to be a problem. If you give a program programmer um, 10 lines of code to review, they'll point out 10 lines of code that could be improved. If you give a programmer 100 lines of code to review, they'll probably tell you it's all fine. So. Really, the simpler the components are, the easier it is to order and test it. And also, 
there you can um, reduce the um, risk of um, you know there being errors hidden in complexity by reusing libraries that have been you know designed well in the first place so there's no reason that you should ever re-implement AES for example uh, when there are really good um, libraries that implement the AES encryption um, you know algorithm for you so you, you know you don't need to write that code the principle of open design is the idea that we shouldn't rely on security through obscurity so we shouldn't rely on ignorance or keeping um, the design or implementation a secret so because if we rely on secrecy for our security as soon as someone who's knowledgeable comes along it all starts to fall apart and someone who knows what they're doing will be able to reverse engineer your, your code and figure out how it works uh, if you have an, an encryption algorithm and the you're relying on the algorithm itself staying secret then eventually that will fail or someone who knows what they're doing will be able to do crypt analysis and figure out how your algorithm works and then it will stop working at that point um, I guess now you can look back at something like Caesar cipher which just shifts all the characters along a couple of places um, as soon as someone finds out that's how your encryption works the whole thing falls apart if you see some encrypted text that's been encrypted with Caesar cipher if you don't know anything about it you might look at it and go that looks amazing that looks very secure I can't read that but actually as soon as someone explains how it works within a short amount of time you can decrypt any message even just by brute forcing the key space of trying all all 26 shifts um, and so um, secrecy can make something seem secure but it can also give a false sense of security um, that's not to say that there shouldn't be some secrets within a system so it's okay to have passwords like keys that you change can, can be secret that's fine but the algorithms that use those keys shouldn't rely on remaining secret and this is obviously sort of related to the open source versus proprietary software um, debate or um, you know way of writing code and releasing code um, but I'm not it's not to say that closed source software is less secure than open source or either way around um, open source software obviously is you know just basically they it's intentional that the software is available and the security doesn't rely on the fact that you can't see the code um, and so that should also be the case even with um, closed source software you shouldn't rely on the fact that no one has access to the code for the security to work the principle of complete mediation is that every access attempt should be checked and whenever access is attempted the action action should be mediated so there's two different ways that we can consider this um, principle one is something like when um, a file is first accessed and a pro program opens a file for example and it checks permission is this program allowed to open this file and write to it and and the decision might be yes it's allowed to do that and that program might keep that file open for days now days later when it goes to save the file um, will the security controls be checked again to check whether or not the program is still allowed to access that file the reality is that on a lot of systems the check doesn't get performed the second time um, the, the first time when it's open is when the, the checks happen um, so exam another example where you, something to consider um, where we, maybe we could be doing things a bit, a bit better or at least understanding what those limitations are when we're considering the security of a system but also this, secur this security principle applies where um, it shouldn't be possible to circumvent the security so for example within an organization if there's some important Im information um, that is you know, classified or restricted access to specific individuals within the organization there might be a few different ways that you can access files you might access them via a shared network drive there might be like local copies of files for example there might be uh, like a web interface to access some information um, and maybe another program that can you know display information and um, 
if there are multiple ways and they don't all perform the same security checks, then obviously the security is going to fall down. Principle of fail-safe defaults is the idea that by default permissions should be denied and the so it should be, well, first of all, no, you don't get access unless you're on this allow list, unless we've explicitly said you are allowed to access the file. So, yeah, by default, denied, and then we explicitly assign um, permission rather than the, in the opposite direction where we um, have deny lists where we say um, everyone can access it unless you're on this list. That's the wrong way to do it. Um, because you know there's more likely for something to go wrong and for something that you've not thought of. So, but in also in more more generally, failure should be safe. So when something goes wrong, it should be coded in a way that, you know, if we deny access to something, things kind of get rolled back to the state they were before they the um, you know person tried to access the file, for example. Separation of privilege is that more than one condition should be met, um, which increases assurance that access is authorized. And one way to think about this is to defense in depth. So we have multiple layers of security. So rather than there just being one hurdle to get over, you have multiple hurdles in place. So for example, you have access controls in place on the system, saying what the user can do. And then you have another set of um, controls in place that says what the program is allowed to do. And you have another set of controls in place that are isolating certain resources from different groups, for example. And by layering security in this way, when one of these things falls over and is not configured correctly or someone manages to escape confinement or something, so someone escapes a, um, a container or, or um, a user um, you know, attempts to access a file, that you have these different layers of security in place so that um, you're still restricted in what can go wrong. So this is like principle of least privilege more than once. So principle of least, least privilege but applied um, on multiple layers or having multiple conditions met. Another way you could think about it would be if you had um, requiring multiple users to authorize an action. So you might have specific very sensitive actions, say for example transferring a large amount of money you might need to have multiple people within the organization sign off on that transaction. And if you have a system designed that enforces that, um, then that can also be considered a um, you know, principle of separation of privilege. Principle of least common mechanism is that you should limit the use of shared resources. So for example, the temp directory, which is used on a Unix system um, to, you know, everyone can save files there. Um, when you put something in a place where everyone can read and write to, it's just riskier that something's going to go wrong. Um, similar if you have shared processes, like a specific process that's running that lots of other processes are communicating with. Um, if that's across trust boundaries, then that's um, you know potentially an um, uh, attack vector, so there's attack surface there. Um, and if you're sharing a kernel, for example, as, as happens with containers, um, or sharing a, a, a system or a virtual machine. So basically, the amount of shared resources and processes that are happening um, can result in a problem if there's a security problem um, in that component. So you could think about it like containers are really good for, for resources and actually you know, containers are amazing in terms of doing more with less resources, but compared to a virtual machine, you're not sh you're sharing a kernel between multiple untrusted containers, and so if the if the kernel itself has a problem, then um, you know multiple containers could escape confinement, for example, as opposed to if they're in separate virtual machines that are isolated separately. Um, so you can consider using isolation to limit shared, shared access. Um, and obviously, even containers are a huge improvement on just when you don't have any confinement or isolation between users or processes. Um, and so the more that you can kind of like limit the, the amount of things that are shared resources, um, you're going to improve security.
the principle of psychological acceptability is all about ease of use uh, and that's about usability and usability and security is often overlooked um, for maybe for decades essentially um, a lot of security researchers weren't really thinking about um, whether the users can actually use the systems uh, but the reality is that security can be viewed as it's essentially it's a supporting technology so the security is there to facilitate things actually working, facilitate the IT systems. And if security becomes too much work or it's hard to understand, users will either misuse it, so they will misjudge the security decisions that they're making and make the wrong decisions, or they'll just circumvent it altogether. So, you know, rather than use your security system, they'll just say, oh, can you email me that file? Um, rather than actually request access through the controlled system that they're intended to access resources through. They'll just end up circumventing the security of the system entirely and therefore the security obviously is not going to perform correctly. So as a, as a guideline, the access shouldn't be much harder than if the security wasn't present at all. Security needs to work without overburdening um, users and obviously there's a huge trade-off there in terms of the complexity of implementing security and making sure that that complexity is not offloaded to the humans involved, the, the end users. As much as possible, the complexity should be handled for the users and taken care of so that the security kind of just works. Um, and the, the security decisions that, that users are making are made really clear to the users. So those are the um, secure design principles that were originally proposed. And there's a couple of extra ones that I'm going to mention. Um, some principles around architecture and design. So when you're designing a system, you should try and separate where you can data from control. Um, so a data or a data file um, shouldn't control executable instructions unless it's very well controlled. Um, and obviously this is the opposite of how web, the web works. So, you know, may, maybe the one of the reasons why websites are so hard to, to get right in terms of security is that, you know, you're mixing up the HTML um, information with all the JavaScript, which just gets mixed in there with the actual executable code. Um, same with PDF documents now, so there is essentially like executable code within PDF documents, which a lot of people don't really realize, but PDF documents can actually run code within them to, you know, update depending on what you click on in the PDF document, for example, um, which you do see sometimes with fancy forms and things that are built into PDFs. Um, but really, it's just there's a really high risk that something's going to go wrong when you take that approach. Um, and so for that reason, where there's a whole set of security um, problems that are almost unique to the, to the way the web works. And, um, but you can avoid some of those problems by separating out, and if you're designing new systems, separate out the data. So if you're saving the actual content, keep that separate from the code uh, where you can. Uh, minimize privileges. So, you know, this is, comes back to the principle of least privilege. So only actually hold the privileges that are necessary at the time. So when you're writing code, you know, you should actually drop privileges when they're not needed. So for example, if you're running as root um, and the program is running as root, the program should just do whatever it needs to be as root and then look, drop those privileges either using capabilities or just drop to a normal user account once the thing that the reason you needed to be root is done, you don't need to continue running as root. Um, so you can also look at things like using access controls and sandboxing correctly to limit um, what the systems can do. So if you're designing a new um, server, piece of server software, uh, so some FTP servers, for example, or, and web servers have, can be configured to put themselves into CH root containers and things. Um, that's not, you know, as you will know from us covering containers in the past or a different topic. Um, it's not as good as a um, CH root doesn't perform as well in terms of restricting access to anything other than files on the system. Um, you know, you're better off using Docker or, um, you know, 
Linux containers or whatever. But um, basically, the idea is that you should, wherever possible, minimize the amount of privileges that you have in whatever means you can. Um, and finally, um, the you know you should try and build your system using simple pieces. So you know actually break up your code into small modules, classes, or even into separate programs, and I only grant the privileges to each of those things, um, rather than think of your system as just this one whole that needs access to everything. Think about what each part of your system needs access to, and actually limit the um, permission. Um, and that will make it easier for you to do audit and review. And so all of these principles that we've just talked about, you can apply, you know, as I said at the start, to when you're designing a new system. And when you are designing a new system, these things should be considered at the design stage. But even later on, if you are auditing the system of things that exist, you can come back to these principles and think about whether these are actually used. And if they're not, then you, you could improve the security by making sure that you think about each of these principles and implement them um, correctly within the system. So thank you. I hope that you found that helpful. Um, these design principles are incredibly um, useful to think about when considering the security of a system.